In this video we want to talk about scarcity and wants. Now scarcity is at the very core of economics. Uh, economics is really a study of the allocation of scarce resources, how we deal with scarce resources. And if we think about it, just about everything is scarce. Uh, manpower is scarce, capital is scarce, the goods that we want are scarce and that's why they command a price. We use price to allocate scarce resources. So the study of scarcity is of primal importance in the study of economics. First of all we, we bump into an idea of unlimited wants that as individuals we always seem to want more we're never really satisfied. I know there are people who are perhaps some religious people who are content with what they've got but for the vast majority we always want more. We're always striving to get more. It's as if we've got unlimited wants. Humans have many uh, different types of wants and needs uh, but economics only looks at man's material wants and needs we have all sorts of wants and needs if we even think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, a topic which crops up in many videos on this course uh, we have the need for the need to be wanted the need for for love and wanted and we have a desire to uh, self actualize to be content with our achievements and but in economics we seem to be more interested in trying to acquire more we're always onwards and upwards, always trying to achieve more and always seeking more. So we're looking for at here material wants, not the the abstract psychological wants that can be satisfied, the contentment we get out of a job well done. Here we're talking about material wants, the things we want. These are satisfied by consuming we use the goods. Um, there could be physical goods such as food or there could be services such as for example heating in winter time. So we satisfy our wants through consumption but we seem to have unlimited ones. Uh, when, we, when we get a car we save up and buy a car we want the next car up we're not really happy with the car we've just bought, we want the next one. And when we get that we want the next one still. Maybe it's a, a function of advertising and marketing that keeps us unhappy, keeps us looking for more. Or maybe it's part of the human condition that we, we feel a deep sense of insecurity so we need to have more items to secure us and our positions in life. Whatever the reason and presumably there are many academic papers and many papers published over the years on this and probably more so by psychologists than by economists. However, whatever the reasons, we do know that we have got almost insatiable wants and we satisfy the wants as far as we can by consumption. There are three reasons uh, why wants and needs are virtually unlimited. Goods eventually wear out and need to be replaced so we, we're always looking for replacement goods. If we buy something which is durable and lasts a long time uh, we're quite happy with it but it will wear out. But in addition to that we may get fed up with the thing as well. We want something new, we want modernity, we want new products we want to be seen as uh, interesting people and having interesting products. We don't want old-fashioned products. But just to go with what we've got on the screen, goods do wear out. So we always are looking for new replacement goods. And as I said, uh, just when discussing the previous point, products are improved over time products contain new innovations and new designs and there are fashions in this uh, in, in the material world. If we're talking about furniture for the home we think a chair is a chair and a table is a table 
but it's not. Chairs are designed and some chairs are fashionable and some tables are fashionable and some ways of living are fashionable and some ways are not. So what we've got is a constant desire to keep up. Not just to replace items which are worn out but actually to keep up with fashion and with trends. So we get fed up with what we've got. So we're looking for new and improved products um, constantly, let's say in the context of computing, the internet uh, increases in sophistication, there are new uh, innovations in web design, in uh, the programming for, for the internet, and we need more sophisticated computers, laptops and tablets and so on, to access those sites. So we have a desire for products. That's number two. Number three, we do get fed up. We get fed up with what we've got. We want replacements. The trouble is we've got limited resources. So we've got insatiable wants. We've got this high level of, of want. But we've got limited resources. Commodities, goods and services, are produced by using resources. And we live on a small planet circling a sun. That's all we've got. We've only got this planet and the resources on this planet. So if we've got unlimited wants and we always want more, we're going to use up the planet's resources and future generations will suffer as a consequence. I'm going to give you a table which uh, shows the resources of the world broken up into what we call factors of production. And we really have four types of factors of production. We have land, labour, capital and entrepreneurship or enterprise. Now when I say land, I don't mean literally land. I mean any natural resource. So land could be fish in the sea. Land can be forestry. Labour are our efforts and capital is our... Uh, these are our reserves, what we've worked at in the past and we've turned into machines and buildings and these are if you like um, consolidated labour. These are the, the product of our labour in the past which we can use now to help us to produce more products. An enterprise is the innovative part of us. The, the entrepreneur is the person who is constantly looking for new ways of producing items and looking for new products and constantly pushing the boundaries. So we have four factors of production. And as I said, land is all natural resources. Uh, labour is the physical and mental work of people. And capital, all man-made tools and machines. So some of us are working at making machines and making tools. These machines and tools will be used by people in the next time period to make perhaps consumer products. So capital is our uh, accumulated work from the past that we're carrying into the future. And enterprise, well, well these are managers and organizers and entrepreneurs and innovators, people coming up with ideas and who are introducing change and improving production, improving efficiency and productivity and trying to meet our desire to have more products. Now of course all of the factors of production get a reward. So for example to land, the reward land gets is called rent. It's a return on the land. Labour gets a wage or I suppose a salary, a wage. Capital gets a rate of return we could classify it as the rate of interest but it's the rate of return on the the capital and enterprise gets profit now the types of commodities well a free good is available without the use of resources it's free we can think of very few free goods perhaps air is free although we pollute the air we, we put our uh, our bad production, we, we pollute the, the atmosphere with uh, exhaust fumes in cars and uh, 
electricity generating plants and fossil fuel whatever and and there is a movement towards recognizing that air is not that free we should look after it it's all we've got so there is a green movement trying to get countries to cut back and try to persuade their populations to be less demanding there's zero opportunity cost for air uh, in a sense we're not giving anything up <laughs> at least classically that's the way we, that's the way we think about it and of course now we know that uh, as we use up the resources of the planet the planet is starting to warm up the polar ice caps are melting sea levels will rise there will be destruction around the world and uh, and we've brought it on ourselves which is quite pessimistic an economic good is a commodity in limited supply so we contrast that with free goods uh, free goods if someone offers you free good at a price you don't you don't buy it off them somebody offers you a bottle of fresh air you don't buy it uh, because air is generally available but economic goods are scarce economic goods are in limited supply so we want economic goods but we have to give something in return we have to give our labor and we give our labor to a company in return for a wage and we use the wage to purchase the good expenditure on producer or capital goods is called investment so when we spend on a capital good we invest so a business for example instead of taking the profits and going on holidays or having a big party they take the profits and buy a new machine that's investment they're going to use the new machine in the future to further increase their production or reduce their costs or or it'll fit with some plan they've got some perhaps a strategic plan that they've got so expenditure on producer or capital goods is called investment please note here these have to be new capital goods um, if they're existing capital goods second-hand capital goods it doesn't constitute investment that's just a something in economics that we need to be wary of so we're talking here about new capital goods now the economic problem well the economic problem refers to scarcity of commodities that's our problem items are scarce as I said the planet is there are many people on the planet it's almost over full and everyone wants more but we only have one little planet so it's inevitable that items will be scarce and the economic problem is how to handle that scarcity there is only a limited amount of resources available to produce the unlimited amount of goods and services we desire that's the economic problem we have unlimited desires and wants but limited resources and that's the economic problem so we have to decide which commodities to make for example do we make missiles or do we make hospitals the government all the time has to make these decisions should it increase its expenditure on the military should it increase expenditure on roads should it increase expenditure on hospitals but it can't do everything and these things are not free it's often said in the UK that uh, certain items are free for example the National Health Service is free well it's not free it has to be paid for it has to be paid for by taxpayers it's silly to suggest it's free education is not free it has to be paid for that's the world in which we live that is the real world in which we live everything else is a fantasy we have to decide how to make the commodities we have to decide what commodities we need and then we have to decide how we're going to make them not easy we have to find the blend between capital and labor the the type of technology we're going to have when it's going to be produced where it's going to be produced who's going to get it 
Do we imply robotic arms or workers? If we use robotic arms, people won't have jobs. On the other hand, if the people have the job, they're doing perhaps a menial task, a repetitive menial task, which is actually dehumanising. They're, they're doing spot welding, the same type of work day in, day out. And they are not very efficient at it because they get bored and they're absent from work because they're so bored sometimes. But yet, the same people will need a wage to buy the goods and services that they want because they've got unlimited wants. You can see the economic problem here is it's very difficult to handle. It's a major problem and there is no easy answer. Who's going to get the goods eventually when they're made? Well, the answer seems to be the people who can afford to buy them. The people who can't afford to buy them don't get them. So how can people afford to get the, the goods? Well, they may have inherited money from their parents who have saved up over their lives or were lucky in business or whatever, but they may have given their, their children some money, so they've inherited money and they can buy, it, buy the goods and services. Or they may have particular talents. They may have gone to school and got degrees and had good jobs and they can afford to buy the goods. Some people don't have that opportunity. So how do we handle uh, a world in which some people don't have the goods and some people do, some people can afford them? How do we distribute from the rich to the poor? And if we overtax the rich, they'll just so simply go away and live someplace else. So we don't even get, we don't get any money off them, any tax revenue off them. Again, as I said, the economic problem is significant and there's no easy answer. I've just inserted here, do we build a sports hall in Wigan or in Working? Wigan and Working are two towns in the United Kingdom. Um, yeah, where, where do we build a sports hall? How do we decide? Perhaps it's by pressure group, by politics, by people campaigning. But eventually a decision has to be made. We're going to build a sports hall in, um, let's say we want to build it in Working. Well then the people in Wigan are going to be very upset. It's an economic problem. Do we have more roads, less trains? Do we have more roads, less hospitals? Do we have more hospitals and less schools? It seems like there's a trade-off. I'll talk about this towards the end of um, this presentation. I'll talk about this idea of trade-offs. Opportunity cost. Well, the opportunity cost, this is a a principle that states that the cost of one good in terms of another, uh, uh, in terms of its next best alternative, I should say. So, if the government builds more schools, the cost of the schools means the government doesn't have that money anymore, doesn't have that resource. It's used the money to build the, the schools, so it doesn't have the money. Therefore, it can't build the hospitals. So, the true cost of the schools is is the hospital, or hosp are the hospitals, that are not built. So people want more schools, then they've got to have less hospitals. If a country spends a lot on its military, it can't spend it on hospitals and schools. It's already spent it, spent it on the military. So the government is all the time trying to work out a balance between one set of expenditures and the next. And the fact that it spends in one direction means it can't spend in the other direction. That's the cost. That's called the opportunity cost. The opportunity cost is defined as the cost of the next best alternative foregone. The cost of the next best alternative given up. Because if the money is spent in this way, it can't be spent that way. Take an example. A gardener decides to grow carrots on, let's say, his or her allotment. The opportunity cost of his carrots, his carrot harvest, is the alternative crop that could have been grown instead. 
So if the gardener plants carrots, he or she can't plant potatoes. So the cost of the carrots are the potatoes that were not grown. That's the true cost. The true cost is what was given up. A decision had to be made. Grow carrots or grow potatoes? The decision was made. Grow carrots. So the cost of the carrots are the potatoes that were not grown. If you become an accountant you can't become a car mechanic because you're an accountant. You've given all your time and effort to become an accountant. You haven't got the skills to be a car mechanic. So the cost for you of becoming an accountant may be your next best alternative which might have been a car mechanic. So now you're an accountant but the real cost of being an accountant is not what you paid in fees at college and, and all the years you went through training. It's not that. It's the fact that you're not a car mechanic. That's what you've given up. Look at this diagram. This is known as a production possibility frontier. And it's quite a famous diagram. It's a guns and butter diagram. It's, it's known in the literature as the guns and butter diagram. Uh, it was popularized by a famous American economist uh, back in the, I think it was about 1940s, 1946 or thereabouts, um, some, uh, a person called Paul Samuelson. And it's been around in the literature a long time, having said that. It was just popularized by Paul Samuelson. And it was based on a speech given by um, a German general during the war. Uh, the German general gave the German people leading up to the Second World War, gave them a choice. You could have more guns, but if you had more guns, you're going to have less butter. He didn't mean guns literally, or butter literally. He meant guns being, if you like, capital goods, capital goods or military goods, and butter, consumption goods, goods that we like to have. Not just literally butter, but consumption goods. But he couched it as guns and butter. So, the people could have more guns, in which case they'd win the war. But in order to have more guns, you're going to have less butter. Alternatively, you could have a better standard of living, better life, have more goods in the shops and enjoy, enjoy life now. But if you do that, you're going to have less guns. Less guns means lose the war. And Paul Samuelson, the economist, popularised this as the guns and butter diagram. So as I said, they're not literally guns. We can call them capital goods on the vertical axis and consumer goods on the horizontal axis. Let's take a point on the curve. Let's say the point A. Now this is represented by so many guns. G1 of guns and B1 of butter. So that's what is produced. There's so many guns, so many military people and there's so many consumer items available. Now, if if the people want more consumer goods, so they want to move from B1 to B2, if they want to move from B1 to B2, they've got to cut back on the supply of guns. So cutting back on the supply of guns will res release resources, productive resources, which can be then used to make more consumer goods. But you can't have more of each. That's the problem. It's sometimes in, in an area called game theory, it's called a zero-sum situation. The more of one, the less of the other. You can't have more of each. We haven't got the resources to do it. So the cost of more butter, B1, B2, is less guns. Now this diagram creeps up uh, in economics uh, as, as you move through your studies and, and you take on more economics you'll meet this diagram more and more. It's a very popular diagram and it turns up in all sorts of situations. We can imagine it representing government expenditure like we talked about earlier. Uh, the government needs to have more hospitals, more schools, more roads, 
more police and so on but it can't have more of everything it hasn't got the resources so it has to prioritize it has to make decisions and if it has more of one it's got to have less of the other and that's the true cost of having more of that item it's what was not produced as I said the definition of opportunity cost is the cost of the next best alternative foregone the next best alternative that was given up that's what we mean by opportunity cost and that's represented in this diagram so that's our talk on scarcity it's a bit depressing somewhat but um, it has to be done and this is what occupies economists and people studying for economics degrees will uh, use this type of reasoning all the time right throughout their studies it is such an important concept but that's all we're going to deal with here in this context so let's leave it at that and say thank you for watching <laughs>